Hello, my name is Michelle Friend. Uh, I was born in 1966 in Canada. My logical interest really started at McGill University in Montreal, where I was, I had the privilege of being taught logic by Michael Hallett in the philosophy department. But we also had Storrs McCall who taught the higher course in logic and he taught courses on, on modal logics and sort of exotic logics that were sort of interesting and intriguing. Uh, and we also, in the mathematics department, we had some very special category theorists, uh, Joachim Lambeck and Michael Mukai. And, and this was also an inspiration. They would teach courses called Logic One, which were really, really high up courses. So it was kind of scary taking that courses. But uh, so I, I had a good background in logic from McGill University. Uh, I went on to do my PhD at the University of St. Andrews, which also it was a sort of hotbed for logicism, which was a, a sort of carrying on of Frege's, Gottlob Frege's uh, program to show that arithmetic is really logical. And this was headed by Crispin Wright and Bob Hale. But also in the, in the logic and metaphysics department, there was Stephen Reed, who was interested in, in relevant logic or relevance logic. Uh, and there were people like Roy Dikoff in the in the computer science department who was absolutely brilliant and knew all sorts of things about logic. So again, I was just kind of immersed in in the world of logic uh, throughout my university career, and and so I almost had no choice, right, except to except to study logic. Um, so. But my, my interests in logic, so they started out with a PhD thesis on uh, philosophy of logic, talking about logicism and what is the uh, philosophical significance of really the neologicism, the new type of logicism. And since then, I became quite interested in relevance logics and, and uh, more deviant logics and especially paraconsistent logic as influenced by the work of Graham Priest in, in that matter, uh, especially, but also, of course, a, you know, a number of other logicians who, who do this very ex exciting and subversive type of logic. So, so it was almost for political reasons, I became interested, or not political in the sense of, of the community of people, but more political in the sense of its being subversive and radical and strange and intriguing and frightening for a lot of people. So apart from Storrs McCall's uh, lectures at McGill University, also Michael Hallett gave lectures on philosophy of logic that were very, very high up. In fact, I think he inspired, or I don't think I'd be completely wrong if I said that he inspired fear in many of the faculty and the graduate students. And the braver faculty would actually come and listen to his lectures on set theory and so on, because they understood that this was very important. The, the gift that, that Michael Hallett had was that he, he, he really inspired by his energy. You know, you, you felt as a student that whatever he was saying was, was terribly, terribly, terribly important and very intriguing and mysterious. And, and there was something very, very interesting about, about taking his courses. Uh, yeah, so he, he, was, he was very inspiring in, in that manner. I'll pause there and then I'll continue with the other part that should be added in so you can cut and paste. So the other part, uh, when I'm talking about University of St. Andrews towards the end, I think I talk about Stephen Reed uh, and the Logicism School and my PhD. So I'll resume with the PhD. Okay, so now I'll start. Well, I was writing a PhD at the University of St. Andrews. I was first supervised by Peter Clark and Stephen Reed. And in the final year, uh, Stuart Shapiro came to join us at St. Andrews. And as Crispin Wright put it, Stuart Shapiro is Mr. Second Order Logic. And therefore it was logical, sorry about the pun, for Michel to be supervised by Stuart Shapiro. He was, he was a very inspiring teacher and very, very 
close and very dedicated to his supervision. One of the wonderful things I learned from him was not only his structuralism, but also that he was quite tolerant of my not agreeing with his position. I think that's partly due to his structuralism where you can move from one structure to another, you look at things from another perspective. And, and so it, there's nothing wrong or right in absolute. So he was not the sort of teacher who wanted you to follow in his footsteps and say what he had to say, but rather he was a sort of teacher who wanted you to find your own position, your own way of thinking, your own structure within which to see things or your set of structures within which to see things. And, and that was very liberating to have somebody uh, tolerant of, of my wild suppositions. Uh, and right now, what am I, uh, right now what I'm doing is I'm working on a formal language. Uh, I was asked to work on a form, well, no, let's put it another way. I was approached by somebody called uh, Olympia Lombardi, who's in Argentina and in, uh, in Buenos Aires, and she's a philosopher of chemistry, and she does conceptual analysis with her students on processes in chemistry, especially uh, microchemistry in her, in, uh, for her, but some of her students are more interested in macrochemistry. And she asked me if there was a formal system that would describe these processes. So I went around looking for such a thing. I couldn't find something that, that really uh, met her needs, which was a language that uh, would talk about mass nouns rather than count nouns. So it's not objects, but it's really stuff. It's stuff that flows. And there are logics that, that have mass, mass uh, that are centered around mass nouns a little bit, but they didn't quite do what, what she wanted. Uh, furthermore, she wasn't interested no, so much in, in inference, in, in deduction, which is what you normally find in a formal system. So I decided since there wasn't anything that really fit what she wanted, I decided to make one up. So I made up a language, formal language, which uh, represents processes in microchemistry, but it can actually be used to, to, um, to represent any process. It doesn't have to be something in macrochemistry. And it's a very much, uh, it's inspired to some extent, of course, by Whitehead and this notion, notion of process and things that flow and the idea of something being expected or unexpected. Uh, there's an interesting modal operator in it, which, I, which uh, stands for the context or the milieu within which a process is taking place. And when a process or a procedure or, or something happens that is unexpected, you get a deviant result, then the idea is that you unpack this operator. So you look at the context, you say, oh, are the, are the, are the chemicals that I'm using, are they pure? Maybe there's too much heat in the room. Maybe there's some sort of electromagnetism that's interfering with the experiment. So this was the idea. And so the scientist who is very much present in the scientific process unpacks this operator. He unpacks what is going on. He unpacks the situation in order to understand why it is that the experiment did not go as expected. So that's, that's the work that I'm, I'm presently doing at the moment. I was also asked to discuss uh, other female logicians who have inspired me. And to be quite honest, when I was first asked about female logicians who had inspired me, I thought, well, there aren't any, or, well, maybe there's one or two. And I, I sort of thought back, uh, okay, I could think of three. And then I thought of four, but it was really, it was difficult to think of female logicians. Um, there just have not been all that many in history. Most of the most of the logicians are men, and I thought also about uh, early logicians who had inspired me, or people who are really only logicians. But then I realized that the logician who most recently has inspired me the most 
is a Hungarian logician, Hoynal Andreka, who works with Istvan Nemeti, and they work on the logical foundations of relativity theory, both special relativity and general relativity. And they do this really using a classical first order modal language. I mean, it's, it's really very, very straight uh, classical logic. And of course, you know, I, I sort of wanted to push them to, to use maybe more constructive logics or, or something a little bit more deviant. But, but um, nevertheless, they have very much inspired me in understanding the relationship between logic and its applications in science. So, so the work that I have done with them is and with their students is work on giving um, talking about the philosophical significance of their project of of um, describing the relativity theories in terms of of uh, logic alone and they use a kind of first order sort of set theory with with uh, quantities and objects such as observers and trajectories it's very very simple and yet they are able to capture the whole of both of the relativity theories. And because there's, they use the same language more or less between the two theories, the big difference being that you have accelerated bodies in general relativity. Because the languages are the same, there's a way of getting from, one, from, from um, general relativity to special relativity and special relativity to general relativity. And you just do it through a series of logical building block changes. So, so this I found terribly interesting as well. And their, their concept of understanding the science through the logic is what makes it epistemologically significant. And they don't understand the science by using one logic. They do it by using many, many different logics. So they they play with the axioms, they switch the axiom, they find, oh, if we switch, uh, if we switch, uh, I don't know, the speed of light to something else, what happens? Does it actually change the science? Which observer observations are still legitimate and which ones are no longer legitimate? So there's this wonderful sense of several different formal systems together and the relationships between them informing their understanding of the physical phenomena. And I, I, I find this is a tremendous and beautiful work and it's, it's in a, a very long tradition dating back to, to Poincaré and Hilbert even and, and um, Axe and Goldblatt and, Goldblatt and Supis and so on. But they've really completed the work that was started by, by these logicians. And Heinal, she works not only on this, but she also works on cylindrical logics, which I confess I don't understand all that all that much. Uh, it's a part of algebra. Uh, and I won't say more because I'll probably say something that's false. But the reason that she inspired me so much is that, first of all, when I, I saw a talk by Heinal and Istvan at one of the logic conferences in, in uh, Sofia in, in Bulgaria. They gave this amazing talk on the logical foundations of the relativity theories. And I talked to them afterwards and it was just a very nice encounter. But, you know, it was, it was relativity theory, which I didn't know very much about, or I didn't really feel I un felt that I understood very much about it. And then another a logician friend of mine uh, who lives in Portugal, uh, we met, I met him at a computer science conference. And he said to me, because we were just talking about our interests and so on. And he said to me, if you're going to Hungary, which I was going to do for a few months, he said, you must go and, and see Istvan and Hoynal once again. So he sort of wrote a type of letter of introduction between me and, and them to sort of re, reawaken their, their knowledge of me. And I went to visit them and they were so uh, accueillant, we say in French, they were so hospitable towards me. We had the most wonderful conversation about 
physics, about logic, about non, you know, non-classical logics, about thermodynamics, about Hungarian politics, about the Hungarian language. It was really, really superb. And I met their students uh, through them. And I've I've collaborated with their students, and and it's really a fantastic working group that they have there. And I've stayed in touch, and I've written some articles on their work and on, as I said, the sort of philosophical significance of of understanding physical processes through logic, through formal systems, and through a whole set of formal systems as opposed to one formal system and what that means. So this encouraged me in my sort of pluralism and in, in logic conception, which I always sort of had. Uh, so her work, I mean, she, she's absolutely brilliant. She's very imaginative and she's very uh, kind towards her students. She, she told me once that she thinks of her students almost as her own children. So. So she really fosters their work and she gives very nice ideas. And she has this very sweet sort of voice, but she's really sharp and, and thinks beyond other people and, and thinks so clearly and so nicely and has this, this amazing way of moving the subject forward, uh, both her and, and, and Ishtvan. They're sort of inseparable. <laughs> they, they, they give talks together and they've worked together they they publish together and so on and i've never seen them apart from each other so <laughs> so they they they're very much almost one person so she has very much inspired me and encouraged me and uh, taken my work very seriously and that has been really very rewarding and also her through not only herself and istvan but also through through her students who also have been very accommodating and and very inspiring. And I was also asked to spend about five minutes talking about academia becoming more inclusive. And I must say that was almost the toughest question (laughs) because academia is not inclusive. It's actually very exclusive. And one of the attractive points about academia is that it's exclusive. You become part of a group that other people can't manage to become part of. Now, the problem about that is sometimes you don't become part of it for the wrong reasons. The wrong reasons being because of your religion, because of your background, because of which country you're born in, because of the language that you speak, because of your gender, because of your sexual orientation, because of you know how tall you are. I mean, who knows? So, and these are the wrong reasons. And for me, when we exclude people on those sorts of grounds, as opposed to the grounds of uh, you don't actually have any very good ideas, so maybe you shouldn't <laughs> you shouldn't join us, or you're not. You're not really that all that bright. Uh, you're not really contributing to the discipline. These are good reasons for, for suggesting to somebody that they take a different route rather than academia or becoming a logician or becoming high up. And they are the wrong reasons uh, for reasons of gender, reasons of background or reasons of language and so on or... or um, other, you know, other reasons why, that people are excluded. And the reason that they are the wrong reasons <laughs> is that they cripple us. They compromise us because we don't get the best. We don't hear the best ideas. We only hear the best ideas of the people who were included for, you know, for arbi- relatively, well, for arbitrary reasons with respect to logical understanding, right? So how to make logic more inclusive? I know that there are certain programs in the United States in mathematics and in logic uh, of women fostering other women to become part of of, uh, academia and to negotiate their way through academia. And I've heard horror stories about about, uh, women who started out um, in the pioneering pioneering years when, when very few women were admitted 
at higher levels in mathematical education or logical education. And they were, they really had a very, very tough time. And again, for the wrong reasons. Uh, so pulse, you know, these fostering networks certainly help. I have personally, I make an effort when I go to conferences to talk to the students, to talk to people who I see are feeling a little bit, you know, uh, left in the corner and they're not really part of the middle of the, of the conversation. So I, I make a special effort to try to draw them in and my interest in other people joining the group is in their ideas. So, and I, you know, I don't care about the background. So I, I very rarely ask people, where do you come from or what, what is your family life like or anything like that? I'm, I'm really interested in their ideas. That might be alienating for some people who want to join the group because uh, I haven't gone through the social the social, uh, normal social niceties of asking people, where are you from? And what does your name signify? And, and uh, I don't know, whatever the normal things are that people talk about. So, but returning to the question of how in principle to make, to make uh, logic and higher academic areas, mathematics, et cetera, more inclusive. Uh, there are some amusing statistics. For example, if you ask in Western Europe, which countries have a more uh, balanced proportion of men and women in the computer science departments and mathematics departments, it turns out one might guess, oh, maybe in Sweden or Norway, where people where there's a better gender balance and more rights for women, but and also the the society is much more uh, female oriented. But it turns out that in fact you find that the same that the balance is better in the southern countries, which are more traditionally machismo, such as Spain and Italy and Portugal. And so I asked the sociologist who discovered this or who, who found, who, I mean, it can't have been that difficult to find out, but, but the sociologist who was, who was working on this, I asked her for an explanation why. And being a sociologist, she said, oh, I have no explanation as to why. So I asked the mathematicians and the mathematicians said, oh, that's obvious because they're not paid very much in those countries. So, so then it's okay for women to be part of those groups. Um, and so I thought that was sort of interesting. And the other explanation was that, well, mathematics is something that you can do sort of from home. You don't have to, you can have children and still do mathematics or something. You know, whereas in physics, you have to go to the laboratory. You have to be there for, for the experiments and you can't, you know, you, you have to then arrange for a babysitter and so on. And so it becomes difficult. I don't know. I don't know what the good explanation is. Uh, but I do find that it's is very interesting and it's quite arbitrary uh, when we and cultural who we exclude and who we don't exclude from from a group of of research and research should be about research not about not about politics that's outside the research but unfortunately that politics does enter in and do I have any recommendations on how to make it uh, more inclusive? No, <laughs> I can't think of anything. I wish I could. Uh, maybe make a little bit of extra effort when people that you notice are shy or are looking as though they're feeling a little bit out of the picture, a little bit neglected. Uh, may, it's worth making the extra effort to try to include them in the group to to make them feel welcome because otherwise we don't hear their ideas and if we don't hear their ideas then we are impoverished we only hear the ideas of the people who are loud and who are confident and sometimes the people who lack confidence have more interesting ideas to share with us and it just takes a very very small uh small gesture to to bring them in to invite them to become part of the discourse and part of the dialogue. 
and of course, you know, then there are more formal methods such as uh, you know, preferring uh, waiting uh, candidacy for for a position a little bit more in favor of of whichever group is is polit is statistically excluded. Um, but those are those are sort of formal mechanisms, and they have they have their problems as well. I'd just like to say goodbye and say thank you very much for your attention. And, you know, please don't feel, you know, everyone, even the people who are really high up and the big show offy people, uh, they too sometimes feel excluded and they also have their insecurities. So don't think that your insecurity is, is or your feeling small or you're feeling timid is only your problem. It's a problem almost everybody has. So, so find courage and the courage maybe should come from pursuing the intellectual interest and don't let anything get in the way of doing that. That is what, that, that is, it's the intellectual interest through which you will develop yourself through which you will discover who you are, through which you it will become a mirror for uh, for your own development. And if it if there's something that you love in logic or in mathematics or in computer science, share that with other people. You know that's your that becomes part of your purpose on earth. So <laughs> so um, so I just encourage encourage more people to to join the group because we can learn from from everybody from everybody's input okay thank you bye bye